Hello, and welcome to another edition of Brussels Sprouts. I'm Andrea Kendall-Taylor. And I'm Carissa Mitchie. And we're so glad you can join us. Uh, This week on Brussels Sprouts, we are talking about democracy trends in Hungary and Central and Eastern Europe more broadly. Uh, We'll focus in on Hungary, where for more than a decade, democracy has been in retreat as Prime Minister Viktor Orban and his right-wing Fidesz party have tightened control over the media and independent institutions like the judiciary. Uh, Freedom House even no longer classifies Hungary as a full democracy, um, making it the European Union's first hybrid regime. And the tension between Hungary and liberal values of the EU has reached new heights just in recent weeks with Hungary in the news after Orban passed a law banning schools from using materials that are deemed as promoting homosexuality or gender change. And of course, just a few days ago, we had the revelation that the Hungarian government is using spyware to target the cell phones of journalists, including some prominent critics of the regime. Uh, We'll broaden our discussion because of course, what's happening in Hungary Um, is just uh, uh, an example of some of the broader trends of backsliding in Central and Eastern Europe, where countries such as Poland and Slovenia are are slowly following in Hungary's footsteps. So to get at all of these issues, to make sense of what's happening in Hungary, and to talk about these regional trends, we're really happy to have two really fantastic experts on these issues. We're excited to welcome J.K. Chaki and Dan Kellerman to the podcast to discuss uh, these issues. So welcome to you both. Thanks for having us. Great. So just by very quick way of background, I want to say that J.K. Chaki is the research director for Europe and Eurasia at Freedom House. And in this role, she works on Nations in in Transit, which is Freedom House's annual survey of democracy from Central Europe to Central Asia. And prior to joining Freedom House, she served as a researcher at Amnesty International. And then of course, we've got Dan Kellerman, who's professor of political science and law and a Jean Monnet chair in European Union politics at Rutgers University. And his research focuses on the politics of the European Union, law and politics, comparative political economy and comparative uh, public policy. So with that out of the way, Uh, JK, maybe we can start with you and have you kind of just give us a little bit of a lay down of what we're seeing happening in Hungary. Um, As we mentioned in an introduction, um, Hungary certainly has been making headlines as of late with the European Union um, tensions rising between the two. I know the European Commission also today, I think, is releasing a report on rule of law that will be quite critical of Hungary. So there's really a number of things. And so I wonder if you can just start. Um, by giving Brussels Sprouts listeners uh, a brief overview uh, of some of the the issues that have emerged uh, vis-a-vis Hungary in recent weeks. Sure, and uh, glad to be here. I'm glad to be on this podcast with Dan even more. Um, So I think there has been a lot happening, but of course the main thing that has been on the news um, over the past few days is the the Pegasus um, spyware scandal. Um, And we have been talking about Hungary for a decade, a little bit more than a decade, uh, because Orban has been in power for uh, more than a decade at this point. Um, And we have constantly been talking about Hungary's um, backsliding, uh, Hungary as a backsliding democracy. And I think the first point I would like to make here is that um, right now is uh, the time to change that terminology. I think it's very important to be much more concrete because what is happening in Hungary and what's happening to some extent in Poland as well, um, I think it's more appropriate to call that an autocratization. Um, That just has a larger focus on the actors and describes it more aptly, um, the current developments. And I think this Pegasus, the spyware scandal, um, as well as the very recently passed uh, anti-LGBT plus legislation are two examples that sort of show us um, how far this regime has gotten. And I consciously use the term regime in this case, uh, because for the first um, cycle that Fidesz was in power, and even for the second one, we could talk about takeover of certain institutions, um, certain democratic institutions, in a way that was, you know, quasi-legal, um, meaning that it respected, it obeyed the, um, the letter of the law, even if not its spirit. 
Um, and uh, and many called like Professor Kim Lane Shepard, I call that regime a Franken state where it borrowed examples from other countries. It was more or less legal. It could point to other countries, but put it together in a way that resulted in this Frankenstein regime. I think we are past that point right now. Um, and, and these two developments make that clear. Um, and I think um, that this is kind of a turning point, similar to previous turning points, um, like the anti-migrant, anti soros campaign. So this regime used to be a, um, a really low fare based regimes, uh, meaning it used these legal tools um, to stay in power. And, and now with the anti-LGBT plus law and with uh, using spyware against its own citizens, I think the Hungarian government has moved from attacks on discrete small groups um, to prop up itself in power um, to more like an indiscriminate targeting of society as a whole where anyone who disagrees with the government could potentially be a target. Um, and of course, with the Pegasus um, scandal is just, it's a shocking violation of privacy, which is even more appalling um, because of the echoes that it creates with, with communist times. Hmm. And so, um, I mean, it's unclear what, what the impact will be in the medium term, um, because it came out just right now. The short-term reactions from the government include denial and, and whataboutism on the other side. Um, but this could blow up in the medium term ahead of the elections. Um, I think we don't know that right now. Um, the responses are somewhat muted right now. Um, so it will be interesting to see um, where things are going. That's really helpful. Um, and obviously, thanks for that. And you put an incredible amount on the table that I think we're going to want to pick up on. You mentioned the elections and some of the regional responses. And so we'll pull some of those threads in a second. But Dan, I'll let you maybe if you want to add anything to that fantastic overview. And if you want, you know, one of the questions that we've thought about in some of our research, Chris and I have been doing some work on personalization. Um, and in our kind of telling of, you know, some of the erosion of democracy that we've seen is it's often a top-led process rather than something from the bottom up and that you can actually see the erosion and gradual dismantling of democracy even when public support for democracy is quite high. And so I wonder if you want to add to what um, Cheke said but also to talk about the factors that you think have been fueling the democratic decline if there's factors that kind of have facilitated it, enabled it, um, and whether or not, and, and, I, and, and, and I don't know if there's anything you want to say about kind of the context, the public yeah. bottom-up context in which that erosion is taking place. All right, I'll, I'll try to touch on all of that. Uh, and again, thanks so much for having me on and uh, giving me the opportunity to discuss these questions with you and with JK. Um, I, I think I'd start by just kind of echoing something JK said that I do think it's very important that we uh, use kind of plain terminology about what's happening here. You know, this uh, in Hungary and what we also see happening in Poland uh, are clear efforts to not not just backsliding on rule of law, although that is happening. That's often kind of used as a euphemism. What we really see happening is a systematic effort to dismantle democracy and to replace it not with North Korea style dictatorship. No one's talking about that, uh, and that often kind of confuses matters. But rather um, what we're seeing is the effort to uh, install a kind of hybrid uh, authoritarian regimes. So regimes that you know, still hold elections, but not free and fair elections, and that um, you know, maintain some of the facade of a democratic process, but are in practice one party dominated autocratic states. Okay? And so that, that's what we're seeing. And of course, that's a broader phenomenon around the world. Political scientists, people like Larry Diamond have talked about a democratic recession uh, you know, since around 2006, where uh, the number of uh, democracies is diminishing. We see um, many regimes going uh, in an autocratic direction. But what's distinctive about Hungary, which is the leading case here, but also Poland, Slovenia, some of the others we'll talk about, is that now this is happening inside the European Union. Right, which is uh, a body, uh, you know, a, a union committed to democracy and rule of law among its members, and is of course, you know, close, uh, closest allies of the U.S. So that's what makes it particularly striking: is 
you know, people are asking, well, how can this happen inside the EU? Um, and we can get to that topic. But that's, that's I think, why it's so important and, you know, and of such great interest uh, to the U.S. Um, and, you know, I guess on, on some of the, the questions, you know, you raised there at the end, um, uh, on Andrea, about uh, personalization and sort of what's behind this. Yeah, I think you know, each of these regimes has, you know, slightly different variations here and different themes, but certainly we start with Hungary, you know, this is very much, you know, a regime that is tightly controlled by the leader, by Orban. And, um, you know, in his case, there's uh, the, the autocracy he's building is in service of also, you know, kleptocracy. In other words, high level corruption among him and cronies around him. The Polish regime maybe hasn't been as focused on corruption yet, uh, but it's also very personalized. And in fact, there the leader isn't even the president or the, uh, of the country, right? Ra rather, uh, or, or the prime minister, rather it's the leader of the ruling party, Kaczynski, who has basically been personally controlled these parties and these tightly controlled parties, because in both countries, support for democracy remains high and support for uh, EU membership and for the democratic values of the EU remains high. But what we have is parties that are just trying to hold on to power and establish themselves as dominant forces you know, for years to come. I'd like to pull on this thread that you just mentioned about what what are the EU's policy options in a lot of these cases. And I know, Dan, you've recently written a report a little bit on focusing on the conditionality of payments um, of EU funds to these countries. Um, you know, from both of your perspectives, what do you view as the main policy options that the EU has on the table, one, to address cronyism, but also in the wake of this um, Pegasus scandal? Well, um, well, I think you wanted me to dive in first, so I'll just go quickly and then we can go over it to Jacob. But I'd say, you know, I, as I always teach my uh, uh, undergrad comparative politics students, you know, follow the money, right? And um, I think one of the mo main tools the EU has is uh, the funds that it supplies, because let's make no mistake, the, the EU is in this perverse position that it's not only allowed uh, these regimes to uh, move in an autocratic direction, but it's richly subsidized those moves, right? Because Hungary and Poland are uh, the lead, you know, among the leading uh, beneficiaries of EU funding. And by the way, they're set to get a huge new tranche of money with both uh, the recovery fund in response to COVID and just more generally, the EU's just adopted a new multi-year budget, you know, that's going to be handing out billions more. So the EU, that, that, the same money that has actually been fueling the kind of clientelist system of, of these regimes could be turned from a problem to a solution if the EU actually makes the money conditional, right, on um, adhering to these rule of law norms and stopping this behavior. And so that report you referred to, uh, Carissa, is yeah, something I did uh, with a couple of colleagues, Kim Shepla and John Marine, at the request of the Greens in the European Parliament. But then the, the report that we did was actually signed off and supported by the, all the main groups in the Parliament, the, the, the center right, the center left, the Liberals and the Greens. And basically what we did was we provided a roadmap for the European Commission of how it could trigger this new, what's called rule of law conditionality regulation it was adopted last year, which is a new set of tools uh, to withhold money to states uh, that uh, put at risk the EU budget uh, with, with problems like uh, problems with their justice systems, et cetera. So we kind of showed how that could be done. And the commission could do that tomorrow. What's more, uh, it can also withhold the initial uh, distribution of the recovery fund monies, which thankfully so far it has, has withheld from Hungary and Poland, but it should keep doing that. Uh, and so the money is the biggest thing. And then also it can bring uh, infringement cases, these basically lawsuits before the European Court of Justice and where those regimes try to defy uh, European Court of Justice rulings, it can bring uh, follow-up cases demanding penalty payments for non-compliance, right? So it needs to do that and do that sort of thing aggressively. The only thing it can't really do effectively um, is this thing called Article 7, a kind of famous punishment mechanism for uh, states that violate the core values, but that requires unanimity in the final stage to really make it work. And they won't get unanimity, but the people often think, oh, you need unanimity to do anything. That's not true, right? 
only that tool really requires unanimity. The other tools don't, and so it should use the other tools. And just JK. to add to that. Yeah, and also, JK, we'd love to hear you add to that and also maybe talk about how some of those tools are being received or responded to by the Orban regime. Does it feel like, you know, how are they framing that? The fact that the European Union is potentially withholding some of these recovery funds, what does that discourse look like in Hungary? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's also an important question. But just to add to um, what Dan was saying with Article 7, yes, it's not a great tool, but it also has a part that uh, can be triggered without unanimity. So even triggering that part just to talk about things would be important, would send a symbolic message. But otherwise, I am in full agreement with Dan that uh, that um, financial tools are the most important tools in the EU's quote unquote toolbox, which the EU loves to use. Um, and, and I also think that perhaps we should be um, much more clear in saying that the EU has no choice to act longer term on these issues, because we tend to speak about this as if the EU was some external actor that is perhaps annoyed by what is going on in Hungary, but it doesn't really have an impact on it. But that's, that's really not the case. Like um, Viktor Orban is at the same table with all of these EU leaders. Um, so whatever is, he is doing there has an impact on uh, all other EU member states. Um, so in that sense, this is an existential question for the EU down the line that it will need to tackle. Um, it, it really has no choice. And the same is true for Poland and what is happening with the judiciary there right now. And it looks like in Poland's case, what Dan mentioned with the infringement action uh, and the injunction that might be coming now. Um, as to how this, how any kind of action will be received uh, in Hungary's case, um, I think that's a question that we often ask and often people say that, you know, it, you might not want to trigger this or that mechanism because that might mean that Orban will just turn much more to Russia or much more to China. Um, I think uh, based on the past decade, we can see that not triggering these mechanisms have, that has already resulted in these turns. Um, so I would say that, yes, the, the response is important. But Hungary and Poland as well, these are overwhelmingly pro-EU countries. Um, and so the government will use, quote unquote, Brussels uh, and will uh, instrumentalize it in, its, in the election campaign in Hungary. Um, but that doesn't really depend on whatever the EU is doing or not doing. Um, so in that sense, we should decouple the two um, and, and think about what the EU needs to do for itself, including Hungary, because the, the EU as an entity that includes Hungary and Hungarian citizens and Polish citizens. Uh, and then of course, think about what the reactions will be, but that doesn't necessarily depend on, on these actions as we have seen so far. Great. Um, so I, I want to um, talk a little bit about the kind of how you would describe the impact of democratic decline in Hungary. and. Um, Roger, maybe you can kind of talk, speak to that. You know, sometimes in some circles in, in, in national security community, for example, if you're talking about what democratic decline means in the NATO context, some people will say, well, you know, it's a military organization and we shouldn't be as concerned about, you know, whether or not they uphold democracy. I mean, that, that's probably a minority in, in amongst a lot of the people that we talk about. But, um, you know, how would you articulate why democratic backsliding, democratic decline in Hungary matters for a national security community. And you mean for, for the national security community here in the US you have in mind too? Right? Yeah, and broadly, I mean, I'm, and on both sides of the Atlantic. So, you know, NATO member states, why is it that we all kind of as a transatlantic community should care about democratic decline in Hungary? All right, well, yeah, the. Let me just go back to something Jake was just emphasizing, which is you know, these regimes, they have a seat at the table. So the problems you know, that emerge in Hungary uh, or in Poland will not stay just in Hungary and Poland. You know, rather, the, these governments will actively try to infiltrate and, you know, in a sense, you know, from the perspective of uh, people who value democracy, they'll try to infiltrate and poison the institutions of which they are members. Um, so, you know, for instance, uh, you know, the Orban regime, you know, they have uh, representatives in bodies like the European Parliament, they, you know, Orban government has a seat in the council, right? So they try to wield their influence 
not just to be able to do what they want at home, but rather to spread their model to other member states, right? So they spread it both within the EU, you know, he supports moves in this direction in Slovenia, uh, but even in the Balkans, right? You know, so for instance, you know, it, it reminds me, by the way, if I can make a parallel that uh, I think all American listeners will understand well, you know, we had authoritarian regimes at the state level in our own history in the South, right? In the period after the Civil War, where we had, uh, you know, systematic uh, disenfranchisement of our voters. We had these autocratic regimes in the South um, run by the Democratic Party at that time. But they weren't just happy to, uh, or they weren't just content to kind of practice their politics there in their own states. Rather, they tried to reshape Washington, right? And, and they did so to a large extent and captured powerful positions in Congress. Well, now let's go back to the EU and NATO. You know, who's in charge of EU enlargement right now, right? Who is the commissioner in charge of enlargement? It's an Orban loyalist who Orban basically pressured von der Leyen say, well, if you want me to support you to become president of the commission, give my guy the portfolio for enlargement so I can try to uh, reshape the EU's approach to the Balkans, right? And you know, that's the kind of thing we see. And then likewise, you know, these regimes, at least in the Hungarian case, very clear, can serve as a Trojan horse for our authoritarian geostrategic rivals like Russia and China and uh, promoting their interests within forums like the EU and NATO, right? So we've seen many episodes already, Jake can tell you more about these too, where the Orban regime has you know, jumped in to try to block collective EU action on uh, you know, things like Russia, on human rights in China. Uh, and we'll see more of that, right? Because again, they have a, a powerful seat at the table in bodies that the US has such a, a vital interest in. JK, I don't know if you want to add anything there. Um, I think perhaps one thing I would add and, and completely agree with Dan on this, that, uh, that Orban's role as, an, as a disruptor is important in this regard. Um, and we tend to focus quite a bit on the vulnerabilities created by what he's doing. Um, and in that we tend to focus, I mean, that per, perhaps is just my personal gripe, but we tend to focus too much on the role that Russia and China are playing. And I'm not saying that that, to, that, that is not important because clearly this is a security threat. Um, it's becoming a security threat um, for NATO an internal threat uh, and for the EU as well. Um, but Orban is acting consciously as a disruptor to increase his own leverage. And, and so when we focus too much on what Russia and China are doing, we forget to ask this more important question of like how Orban or for that matter, um, Serbia's Alexander Vucic um, is they are using these relationships, how they are playing these relationships to, to increase um, their own leverage um, and to use these new patrons and to what end they are using um, these relationships. Because I think, you know, Russia and China are not necessarily making advances in um, these regions because of their own unique skills or what they have to offer. Um, although that's important as well. But in Hungary's case, they are being invited um, into the country. And, and so we should not overlook that uh, and that should inform our responses um, to the threat as well. Absolutely. These are all very important points about keeping that focus, too, on what Orban and others are doing. I'd like to ask a little bit if you could dust off your crystal balls as we look to 2022 and the Hungarian parliamentary elections. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your predictions for what that might look like. You know, the opposition has mentioned that they're going to try to unite in advance of those elections. I think we've heard this before. So how probable do you think it is that they will succeed at uniting? And then are you hopeful that a united opposition um, could defeat Orban? I can start if I, yeah. Um, I think, um, so most of the opposition is running united um, as of things stand right now, except for Miha Zang, which is this far right party. Many say it's a puppet party, um, but the rest of the opposition parties, they have a, an agreement to run together and primaries will be taking place in the fall. Um, these primaries are, I think a chance for mobilization. Um, 
but they can also complicate things because they show you know the, how the sausage is being made um and uh, and that's already sort of visible um politics around primaries is is ugly um as politics in general and uh, a number of opposition voters might be uh, put up by that by what's going on right now um but numerically um defeating uh, Fidesz is, is really only possible if the opposition unites. Um, I think that has become clear over the past decade. And a united opposition actually stands a pretty good chance, uh, even though it would have to win by more than three percentage points uh, to be able to turn it into a majority, an actual majority, because of gerrymandering. So there are definitely difficulties already at that level. Um, not to talk about the electoral campaign and uh, inequalities in access to resources and so on and so forth. Um, polling figures at the same time have been encouraging, um, although over the past month or so, um, Fidesz uh, has been improving. And, uh, and so I think that the playing field is more or less open. Um, it's not yet decided, but um, we are looking at a very, um, rhetorically violent campaign period um, that will be coming. And, uh, and perhaps um, to look at another example where the playing field was very much tilted, but the opposition still managed to win and that could be um, instructive in some sense. Um, recently, that was in Montenegro. Um, so we see that in similar cases where there is this facade that's still remaining, it's possible for the opposition to win um, given certain circumstances. Uh, if people are angry enough, um, if there is a scandal, and so on and so forth. But then there will be this question of what happens afterwards. Um, and I think, actually, opposition parties have already started discussing that. Um, and, and that's a discussion that is much more difficult. Uh, and, and I'm not sure if that leads to any good for now. If, if I could add something uh, to what Jake has said, I would just say that I'm, I'm slightly more pessimistic, I think, about the potential for the opposition. I, I sort of hate saying that because I wish them the best and hope they could succeed against the steep odds that they face and the, on the tilted playing field. But um, I, I find it hard to imagine that happening. And let me just back up uh, to say something that I think some people you know, don't always appreciate because they... They look at Hungary, they say, well, this regime may be far right, it may have autocratic tendencies, but hey, after all, they're elected, so it's a democracy. But let's take a st step back and recognize that already the last two parliamentary elections in 2014 and 18 were heavily criticized by the election monitors of the OSCE, where they said that you know these were free elections, but they were systematically unfair because, again, as you see in these uh, what Levitsky and Way, the leading political scientists of this kind of thing call um, competitive authoritarian regimes, that what, what you see here is that um, the regime uses state resources, right? And you know the ruling party uses all the state resources it controls. It's kind of hegemonic control of everything from me the media to uh, the election regulator themselves, et cetera, to tilt the playing field you know, systematically in their own favor. Okay? And, and so we've seen that already. Now, of course, it didn't go... And there was some evidence in rural areas of some cheating, but we didn't have, you know, just systematic across the board, you know, lying about the votes. Okay, it was more subtle techniques of fining opposition parties, uh, using control of the media to advantage the ruling party, etc. Uh, but I guess my, my thought, the reason I'm more pessimistic than JK, I think, in short, is that precisely because the opposition is finally uh, uniting in an effort to overcome this rigged election system that Orban has set up uh, that favors his party. Because of that, Orban will be more worried that there could be mass mobilization against him, he could lose. And because he's more worried, I think he'll be more willing to cheat, right? And he'll go to further lengths. Uh, and he is in the position to make sure he doesn't lose, I think. So it's just hard for me. There's too much at stake for him now. I don't think he'll allow himself to lose. So that, that's that's how I see things. Yeah, and I mean, and also, um, I think there was an incredible statistic too about, you know, with the gerrymandering that they have increasingly won maybe a smaller proportion of the votes, but yet they receive more seats in, mm -hmm. in the legislature. So all of those, just like what you said, all the state resources. 
I want to start zooming out just a little bit and kind of take a transition question to talk about what the regional reactions have been to Orban. Um, and Dan, I know you have re recently written a piece on um, Angela Merkel and her role in potentially protecting and defending Orban. You know, he, the, the Fidesz party remained a part of the European People's Party for quite some time. I know they left this spring. But if you can talk about kind of, you know, what that backsliding has looked like in a regional context and maybe, and, and especially as we're looking to Angela Merkel's, you know, transition out her legacy and maybe, you know, what a future German government might be able to do um, to, to push back against some of these regional trends in a, in, a, in a way that may be different than what Merkel had done. Sure, yeah, no, thank you for the question. And, and yeah, there, of course, there's lots of great things about Merkel and in many ways, um, I'm sure we'll, we'll miss her leadership. Um, however, on this issue of sort of democratic backsliding within Europe, she's been a key part of the problem, not part of the solution, right? And as, as you mentioned, for over the past decade, and again, this, this backsliding or this autocratization in Hungary uh, didn't you know, happen in the last two years, it's been going on for a decade. And over that period, right, Orban's party was part of this transnational um, Europe, what they call Euro parties, which is a transnational political party that operates in the EU context. Call, and that his Euro party is called the European People's Party, where the largest member and his biggest and most stalwart defender was Merkel's Christian Democrats. Right? And I can tell you that even when other members of this center-right uh, Euro party were having qualms about their association with Orban saying, yeah, he's really becoming far right and authoritarian, maybe we should push him out. It was uh, the Christian Democrats of Germany and Merkel quite specifically, right, who intervened to say, no, we have to keep him in the fold. And they protected him against EU censure. Now, finally, I won't go into all the details, but as you mentioned, finally, a few months ago, there was a, a kind of breakup. He took it too far. They finally you know, were moving to kick him out and he, he sort of jumped before he could be pushed. Now, that's a good thing because that means he's lost his kind of blanket of political protection at the EU level. And he still has other defenders like the Kaczynski regime in Poland um, or the you know, Slovenian government, but those are smaller players. So he's lost his biggest protectors. And I think the bigger um, thing I would say there is that while the center right was defending him, other Euro parties have their own problematic members, right? So um, you know, the, uh, yeah, the Polish government was part of a different kind of right wing bloc. Uh, the socialist party, uh, you know, they, they've had problematic members in, uh, for instance, in Malta, and the liberals uh, had the, the ruling party in the Czech Republic, uh, which has its own kleptocracy problem. So I guess what I would say is that in terms of this pan-European politics, the mainstream parties need to clean house, and they need to crack down on their own members who might be drifting in this more autocratic or kleptocratic direction. That's, I think, what's important. Uh, is for mainstream parties not to tolerate this kind of behavior amongst their members. And maybe, um, JK, just a quick follow up for you too. You know, when you look at some of the democracy literature, one of the factors that can matter is international context. And so I wonder to what extent you think, you know, that remaining as a member of the European People's Party and some of this, you know, perhaps, you know, the support, the defense that that um, Fidesz received from Merkel uh, and her political party, do, 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 would you see that as an enabling factor? Was that something, do you think that international context played a role um, and helped facilitate and enable some of the democratic decline in, in Hungary? Yes, I, I tend to agree with them that um that it helped Orban in some sense uh, and, and German capital as well um, has been instrumental in, in sustaining the current government. Um, at the same time, I think that um, right now we are facing a new situation uh, and of course Orban has uh, been trying to um, uh, bring together uh, these other parties, other far-right parties um, and, and form a new group uh, at the EU level. And, uh, and and I think um, the chances of success for that are, are perhaps, I, I am not very optimistic in that regard, in that sense, that these um, far-right parties have diverging interests in so many issues. 
Um, so for them to be able to come together and work together as a party grouping, um, I think that looks somewhat unlikely that, that this will stay a group um, that can function longer term. Um, so that means that there is this opportunity at the European level right now um, uh, to tackle what is going on in Hungary, because politically um, there is perhaps much more room for maneuver uh, at the moment. Uh, and then one additional thing I would say, um, which is also new that the Visegrad group used to be this united um, front, uh, especially with the Slovak government, with the previous Slovak government, uh, and then Babish, of course, is still in power, but it's no longer a united front. Uh, I mean, Babish is facing re-election, his chances are not so great, uh, and there is this new ish Slovak government, um, which did not support Orban, uh, for example, when it came to the, um, the, the anti-LGBT plus law. Uh, Babich eventually spoke out in favor of that law. Um, that did not happen uh, in, in Slovakia. So in that sense, it's also a, a new situation um, regionally. Um, and, and that means that there might be much more movement over the next uh, you know, several months to a year. I'd like to zoom in a little bit on two other EU member states where we've seen this autocratization process um, happen. One, um, I'm curious if you could provide some background for our listeners on what is happening with Poland and in particular, a bit of a focus on the Constitutional Court's recent decision that EU decisions are non-binding and what that means in that greater trajectory of judicial independence in Poland. And then um, on a separate note, um, I'm curious too about Slovenia. I mean, we've seen a lot of recent policies by their prime minister um, all during Slovenia holding the EU presidency. So how should we be making sense of that? So maybe I'll start with uh, Poland, um, uh, if that's fine. Maybe Jake, I can uh, leave Slovenia for you or so we can divide it up if you like. But I guess what I'll start with on, on Poland, I think one important background context to explain some of the different trajectories uh, in the disputes with Hungary and Poland is that uh, when, when Orban came to power, uh, he managed in that breakthrough election, he had to get two thirds of the seats uh, in parliament, which in Hungary allowed him to write a new constitution in short. So that in terms of the Hungarian law, you know, one could argue things he did didn't violate their own constitution. They were legal because he basically just re recreated the whole system uh, to serve his ends. Now, if we move over to Poland, the ruling party there, the, the PIS uh, or peace regime, uh, they never won that kind of constitutional majority. And so but they still wanted to create this one party system and um, dismantle democracy, et cetera. But they had to do it by directly going uh, into conflict with their own courts, right? So that goes back to 2015 when they come in. And so to go fast forward through a bunch of details, essentially what happened is they waged a very frontal assault on their own judiciary, basically pushing out judges, creating new courts, right, uh, that, their, that their own courts declared to be illegal, right, but they would just ignore that. And so then what happened gradually is that as these judges were coming under assault from uh, their own government, they started using one of the key tools in the EU legal system, right, which is called the preliminary reference procedure, where in essence, any judge in the EU can send a question to the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg and sort of uh, ask if something happening in their country violates EU law. I'm simplifying, but that's basically how it works. They ref send the case to the European Court of Justice, the EU's high court, and say, well, they describe what's happening in their country, say, does this violate you know, the treaties or some EU requirements? And then they get an answer. Well, so that brave judges in Poland were doing that. But then what the government came back and did is they set up a whole disciplinary system, believe it or not, where they started punishing judges for sending cases to the European court, which is precisely what they're supposed to do in the EU system. And long story short, then essentially uh, the European Court of Justice said this disciplinary system you've set up violates EU law, you have to stop punishing judges, et cetera. And the Polish court just said, you have no right to say anything about our courts, 
and we will do as we please and override your ruling. So they are directly challenging the supremacy of European law uh, and the primacy of judgments of the Court of Justice on these questions. And so that is a frontal assault on the basically the legal backbone of the EU, right? And so now the, the commission is you know, promising follow-up uh, action with uh, bringing um, a case to demand fines for this non-compliance, and we'll see where it goes in the weeks to come. JK, I don't know if you have anything to add on the Poland piece, but I would also be very curious about your reflections on Slovenia, especially given that they're um, holding that EU presidency um, all while this backsliding is occurring in their country. Yes, so sh just one thing to add uh, on Poland, uh, and I hope I did not miss something that Dan was saying because my connection was cutting out. But uh, uh, I think what is important in Poland's case is that they did not only overhaul their own judiciary in a way that violated Polish legal norms, but also violated um, European norms. And, and these judges, for example, in Poland, they are EU judges as well. Um, so it has an impact on uh, the rights of EU citizens, not just Polish citizens, but let's say other EU citizens, if they um, have a court case in front of a Polish court, it's very important for that um, to, you know, to, to respect um, independence. And so this conflict was always supposed to come to a head uh, at some point um, with the EU. And, and that is um, what we are seeing right now over the coming weeks and months. Um, when it comes to Slovenia, I think, um, I mean, what we are seeing there is that there is a, an ideological agreement on certain issues um, with Orban, for example, or, or with, with Kaczynski. Um, so we see Janša's um, SDS party um, copying Orban in some regard. Um, and this is something that we talked about in our uh, most recent Nations in Transit report is that we are seeing the spread of these anti-democratic norms um, in this uh, closer region and, and the spread of these practices. Um, so one example that, uh, that Jansha is deploying is just these attacks uh, on, on the media, uh, which are very reminiscent of what Orban uh, was doing or earlier. Uh, and to some extent, what we are seeing happening in Poland as well with attacks on, on TVN just very recently. So we see this um, anti-democratic norm exchange ongoing on, uh, going on in between these countries, uh, which makes it even more um, important uh, and, and perhaps even more dangerous um, what is happening in Slovenia right now. Um, so it's important to watch not just because um, because of the ongoing exchange, but also because, um, of course, Slovenia has the, the EU presidency right now. Um, and, and it can be used as a symbolic tool, as we, as we saw with, uh, with Hungary earlier. All right, this has really been just such a fantastic discussion. We're getting close to the end and I wanna wrap maybe with one final question for both of you. And that is kind of to hear your thoughts on what the United States role is in all of this. And so, you know, we've talked a lot about the European Union, some of the tools and the toolkit it has at, his, at its disposal. Um, but what is the role of the United States? You know, obviously we have with the Biden administration, um, a, a government that has refocused and elevated the role of democracy and human rights in US foreign policy once again. And so what is it that you would hope um, that you would see coming from this administration? Uh, some of the steps that you think that the United States could take to help push back against this democratic decline in Central and Eastern Europe. And so Dan, maybe we can start with you and then end with uh, JK. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. And um, I'd start by saying, you know, that one of the first things uh, the administration can do is uh, to use the right language. And it's, I think, very promising that if you go back to 2019, I think it was already, uh, then um, candidate Biden uh, was talk talked about the advance of authoritarianism around the world and mentioned not just uh, you know, countries like Russia and China, but also uh, mentioned Hungary in that context. And I think it's important because, you know, again, as, as we said, often the EU leaders, probably because they have to sit at the same table in the council with Orban, they're reluctant to kind of say these things, right? They, they just use euphemism. They, they can't 
they won't even admit that reports by places like Freedom House or the VDEM Institute have recategorized Hungary as authoritarian. They won't admit it. Uh, the, the US, I think, is freer to do that. And I'd like to you know, see the Biden administration continue to use the kind of language which uh, uh, Biden has himself used. So call out these terms, um, you know, apply pressure to them. And, uh, you know, I think there can be, you know, economic pressure as well, kind of, um, you know, in terms of uh, the signals we're sending about where we want to invest resources, et cetera. And I, I think uh, by also applying pressure to the EU, Ultimately, it's going to be for the EU to solve these problems and for, the, of course, the societies themselves to do it. But I think, you know, we can make it very clear that we uh, want our allies to kind of clean house internally, right, uh, so that we can, you know, take on the more global threat of authoritarianism that President Biden has made you know, a clear centerpiece of his foreign policy. And JK? Yes, very, very much agree with Dan on that. Uh, I think the U.S. has a very important to, role to play right now, um, and that is clear to the new administration as well, despite these competing priorities. Uh, and I think it's also clear that the previous approaches did not work. Um, so in Hungary's case, neither shutting Hungary out, uh, nor what was supposed to be about emphasizing concerns only behind closed doors, these did not work. Um, but that was, I think, partly because Hungary did not receive enough attention, which resulted in Orban being able to punch above his weight. Um, so I think right now it's important to have a, a flexible yet very firm approach, as, as Dan was um, saying, especially when it comes to Hungary, where the two sides can talk, but the US makes it very clear what the, what the red lines are and stands up um, for values. Decoupling um, Hungary and Poland could also be an option. Um, I think um, that's something that we should talk about. And, uh, and then in terms of concrete steps, for example, um, next time to send a message comes when, uh, when appointing new ambassadors. Um, so these ambassadors have long been political appointees. We knew that um, if that changes, that would certainly send a very strong message. Um, and and the Biden administration's focus on corruption is also extremely important for this region. Um, so uh, continuing to focus on corruption and, and using some of the tools um, that the administration has used uh, previously, um, I think um, that could deliver results um, down the line. Well, thank you both. Again, I mean, it's just really a tremendous conversation. It's such a, it's a, a clearly an important topic, but also something that's really difficult um, to know kind of how to push back, you know, with this kind of slow degradation of democracy, it often is like the frog in the boiling pot of water. And it's hard for outside actors to know how to push back. And I think you've both kind of given us some really um, wonderful uh, examples and ideas for what the role of outside actors can be, both the European Union and the United States. And we're just really thankful for all your scholarship on your on this work. So JK, all of all everything that you do with Freedom House and, and elevating and keeping a light uh, on these important issues. And Dan, obviously all of your scholarship on these issues contributes to the field tremendously. So we're thankful for all of the work that you do. And then maybe just to put in one terribly gratuitous plug for work that Carissa and I are doing, we just published along with Erica France and Joe Wright, a piece in the Journal of Democracy on how personalist politics is changing democratic politics. Um, so if people want to check that out, you know, we're, we've been thinking a lot about how the rise of personalism is, is, is influencing democracies. Um, so with all of that, you know, this is a, an issue that we at, in our program will continue to talk about. And we hope that we get to continue to have discussions um, with both you, Dan and, and JK. And again, just thanks for doing this. And um, hopefully we'll get to do it in person at some point soon. Thanks so much. Really enjoyed the conversation and look forward to, to reading the study you mentioned. I always learn so much from uh, both your work. So thanks so much. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and also for elevating um, this topic uh, to the discussion. Thank you so much.